Hello everyone from across the lake or across the oceans and my name is Mo Chen from Zhanghua Christian Hospital and I hope everyone is keeping safe in this uh, extraordinary time. I hope everyone is safe in doing this pandemic. So uh, we do things different in the pandemic era. So uh, I'm a board certified uh, urologist in Taiwan and my topic today is for the explanation of uh, endoscopic approach and experiences in the upper urinary tract urolithiasis. We do upper urinary tract uh, surgeries. Uh, we average around 700 to 1,000 uh, endourology uh, procedures per year. So I'll basically explain how we do things over here and I have a small clip at the end to explain how we do our endoscopic uh, lithotripsy for uh, upper urinary tract stones. So this is our overview. Our overview basically with the assets, the uh, emergency situations, and how we choose our treatment plans for our urinary tract systems. And at the last, we'll do uh, how we do things in our department. So this is our sources. Uh, I take my information from the EAU guideline, the Cambridge Urology, and the AUA update series. Basically, uh, there's a lot of factors to in determining the treatment modalities of, for urinary uh, tract systems. Uh, basically, it depends on where you live, what kind of facilities you have, and the personnel, and also in different countries have the different health regulations. And are, also, we have to take in consideration the economic factors for the treatment plans. So. Uh, in Taiwan, we have a single payer health system. So basically, uh, we have to give the patients the, the decision on how do we choose it. So other factors, uh, remove all the factors uh, from the facility personnel. Uh, we have the stone factors. Uh, for example, if, if it's an emergency situation, I basically teach our students. This is basically kind of like how we do house shopping. The size and the locations matters. In emergency situations, uh, basically, uh, we have to control the patient's uh, underlying condition. And we have basically bacteremia, sepsis, uh, septic shock syndromes. I'm pretty sure everybody uh, is a healthcare personnel. Uh, basically, quick uh, overview uh, of this thing, uh, of our, our definition for our sepsis. In the emergency situation, we basically know quick sofa, basically a tachypnea and the vital sign change along with the infection source. And E. coli, KP is the most common that we encounter during our urological situations. The incidence of sepsis increases, but the mortality has, has been decreased. Basically, uh, our, it, it also relates to our healthcare system. Uh, the more readily available, the, the more patients survive. So this is how I teach my students then ask them to read over the surviving sepsis campaign. Basically, uh, this is very helpful in, in the patients, and this will also increase the patient's survival during this uh, emergency period. So I'll skip over this, and this is basically uh, taken from the EAU guidelines, and this is basically the definition and criteria for each sepsis and septic shock. And the management uh, suggests uh, if you can have a central line, that's perfect. Uh, if you can Basically, the peripheral line, which measures the MAP, it's perfect for this thing. We can use that as the uh, surrogate to see the tissue perfusion for each patient. Also, urine output is very, very important in urology. So basically, I suggest uh, you have a urine catheter for this patient so we can monitor the urine output. If your urine output is low, then I suggest more treatment for this patient. And this adjuvant measurements for this fluid, uh, corticosteroids, glucose level, uh, also probation. So all this is depend on what you can offer for this patient. So for us, a single payer, we get whatever the patients, uh, basically we treat the patients, then we uh, apply for the for the reimbursement from the national healthcare system. So it's really, really helpful for these patients who are in Taiwan to they get a lot of good quality healthcare for this for under our single payer system. And other recommendations for antibiotics also include uh, uh, cephalosin uh, for this patient. So most uh, antibiotics that we use, uh, 
basically depend on patients. Uh, usually we start with cephalosporin if the patient does not have any drug allergies. And also uh, we recommend more uh, late stage uh, antibiotics for this patient if they have a uh, more risk of uh, resistance uh, if they are in uh, long-term healthcare or being in and out of hospital or currently or it recently has undergo any intervention. So those are more uh, high risk for antibiotic risk resistance. So it depends on on your location, on the patients, uh, if there's any resistance, and then you adjust your antibiotics accordingly. This is basically the algorithm that we follow for this patient. So uh, we basically stabilize the patient first, and then we consider the, any uh, intervention for this patient. For urologists, when they call us after we stabilize the patient, we have to survey this obstructive neuropathy. Usually they call us uh, this, this signs of obstruction. So uh, how do we get rid of our obstruction? So this also refers back to uh, what kind of uh, uh, treatment modalities you have in your hospital. After you control the sepsis and urea in obstructive kidney, uh, you have to find a way to decompression for the obstruction. So you can either go the percutaneous way or, or ureter catheter through the ureter stem. So either way, it's this little evidence, either one is more superior to the other. So it depends on what you are good at. So I just treated a patient that has obstruction of uh, uh, due to cancer in the bladder. So we couldn't see the UO. So basically we have to do a percutaneous, so we, we I just did a percutaneous uh, on the patient. So uh, it depends on what you have or what you can do. I suggest for urologists, if you know how to do both, that's perfect. Uh, if you only can do one, and nephrostomy is a perfect example of uh, obstruction to get rid of patients. So, so for the management, uh, it's equally uh, effective. It depends on what your facility has and what you don't have and you, you, you go according. So basically the main idea is to get rid of obstruction. Either you do it uh, percutaneously or do a ureter stent. Either way, it's fine. So uh, if we get rid of the obstruction and the patient is not in the emergency situation, so for the renal stone, how do we choose uh, for, the, for the patient? So for the guideline, it says, uh, when you follow a patient, you can either use ultrasound or KUB either in six months or yearly. So uh, in our department, we recommend the patients to follow up every six months if they can. And usually if they are, their compliance is really good and they'll come back every six months just for a checkup. I also recommend doing the more warm or warmer weather. So in Taiwan, we have four seasons. So basically I asked my patient to come back around in summertime or so for a checkup uh, if they can. Between checkups, if they have any symptoms of renal colic, if they have pain in the frank pain area, uh, any lust symptoms, any frequency urgency, I ask them to come back for a routine checkup if they can. And this is also uh, the basic uh, follow-up that I give my patients uh, uh, during routine. Uh, to check if there's any hematuria uh, or any signs of UTI and an ultrasound KUB every six months is, is uh, plenty enough. In the pre-intervention, what do we need to consider? So besides uh, what you can do in your facility, you have to design uh, this other factors like patient factor. Do they have any anticoagulants? Do you have any CV problems if the patient is obese or not? These are also more risk factors for bleeding. Uh, bariatric surgery, you have to consider uh, if the stone, if you are considering doing a extracorporeal lithotripsy. Bariatric patients, they really have a hard time to get rid of those stones. So if you are considering stone free, so I basically recommend either percutaneous or do a uh, intrarenal uh, renal surgery for the stone. So other stone factors includes uh, uh, stone composition. If they have previously stone analysis for the patients, and if they are like uh, calcium monohydrate, uh, cysteine stones, 
those are really harder to get rid of with the extra corporal. So if they have the history of that, I recommend either using uh, more uh, intervention for this patient, either use a laser or percutaneous, or either, you can even do a mini uh, PCNL for this patient. For the size, also size and location, just like any good houses, uh, the size for the stones in the kidney, Usually, uh, if they are smaller than four, four millimeters, they usually pass within 40 days. About 90% passes 40 days. So basically, you can use pain medications, also some roraproxen or benthyl for the, for the medications for the patient for help stu uh, for the, for the, for the stone passage. Also, there's some studies about using alpha blockers. Uh, you can use tamsulosin or psilodoxin, these medications to help pass the stone. So locations also matter. If the smaller stones closer to the bladder, you can probably monitor, use uh, medications or medical expulsion therapies for these patients. For the higher up stones, if the stones is larger than one centimeter, it depends on which modality you use. Uh, basically, bigger than one centimeter, so we recommend easier using endoscopic approach. If the smaller than one centimeter, extracorporeal shock wave is also basically have the same stone free rate as the endoscopic. So it depends on which uh, stones and which calyx, which, if it's the cavity in the diverticulum. It all factors in into your uh, uh, choose how you choose the intervention for this patient. So these are other factors like the clinical factors, of obese patients, uh, any anomalies, any stone factors. It will go in to affect your how you manage these patients. So indication for surgery, as you can see from the EAU guideline, uh, for smaller stones. If they are asymptomatic, you can just follow up the patients. And, and for, the, for the patient, it doesn't matter if you use extra core observation or shockwave lithotripsy. But usually, we recommend the patients to get a shockwave lithotripsy. Well, we, we are single payer. So if they can afford it, I suggest then uh, if their stones is larger than one centimeter, so I recommend uh, using the extra corporal uh, for the fragmentation. Uh, it's, Less pain when the stone passage, uh, if you compare uh, smaller stone compared to bigger stones. So I recommend it uh, in, in, our, in our situation. It depends on which situation in your country or whatever. You can adjust according to your insurance guidelines or whatever is more helpful for the patients. So uh, for the patients, uh, renal stones uh, larger than one centimeter and smaller than two centimeters, I recommend in undergoing shockwave literature in Taiwan. It all depends on the situations in your country. So other indications include uh, stone growth, uh, any obstruction, infections, symptomatic patients, and if there are any professions that require going in, the, they are not within the medical facility for a long time. These are patients and traveling. These patients are recommended for stone. So it all reverts back to how uh, you approach this patient and what kind of things is available in your country. So how we choose, uh, basically the size and the locations uh, also revert back. So size location really is an important and factors in determining the stone treatment selection for the stones. So uh, this is a really good breakdown for the stone size. It's available in the EAU guidelines. And in, in my practice, I basically uh, uh, divide the patient in uh, less than two centimeters and uh, greater than one centimeter. Uh, smaller than one centimeter, uh, usually if they're around 0.5 to one centimeter, we can do shockwave literacy if the patients uh, wish or if there's uh, symptomatic patients or if they have previously treated stone and there's a stone growth and we recommend it to get rid of the stone before it falls and causes obstruction. So for the larger stone, I also recommend doing a percutaneous uh, treatment for the patient. Also, if your facility can do retrograde intrarenal surgery, that's perfectly also for uh, patients who are more comorbidity for bleeding. And the retrograde intrarenal surgery is perfect for these patients. For smaller stones, asymptomatics, you can observe 
they have uh, symptoms or if they have previously uh, obstruction, they are afraid that they fall uh, it cause these uh, clinical symptoms, then you can suggest either using the shock wave or uh, endurology. You know, either way, uh, between one to two centimeter stone, depending on what kind of surgery you are more proficient at. Uh, for me, I do mini perk more proficient than I do reels. So uh, I'm starting to doing reels. So Basically, for the larger stones, I basically recommend patients do percutaneous. If you are more proficient in doing retrograde intrarenal surgery, then retrograde intrarenal surgery might be the first choice for you. So it depends on what you're more proficient at. If you are more proficient at whatever, you can choose that for the patient. You can just decide for which one. Uh, it all depends on what you're good at. So basically, that's how you do for the lower post stones, this is more uh, controversial for the one to two centimeter stones. So shockwave literacy is awesome. It's a perfect surgery for the patients who doesn't like to get catheter or it's hard time for the hospital admission. So we can do this in a day surgery with shockwave literacy with patients around uh, 30 minutes to 45 minutes and they can go home. So for these, basically I suggest for the patients, they can try and shockwave first, if this is the first time I see the patient, I recommend them to do shockwave literacy first. And if the stone does not break up or it's not stone free in the next month or two follow up, if the patient has persistent symptoms, then I suggest uh, recommend using the literacy. If, if the stone doesn't break up after one to two uh, shockwave, basically the chance of breaking up is really, really slim. So for the lower post stone, either way, it's fine, but I would suggest maybe shockwave literacy might be a first choice to see if the stone can break up. So shockwave literacy, there's a lot of contraindications and you have to make sure there's, there's no uh, aneurysm around the stones, pregnancy, if this patient have bleeding tendencies, then these might be le uh, less uh, of the first choice. So these are the stones that are less likely for the stone to break up, like the shockwave resistant stones, like calcium oxalate monohydrate, blue shy stone, cysteine stones. For the infodibular pelvic angle, the longer pole calyces, these you basically need to do a CD scan. So it also revert back to if you can't do this procedure, say for the patients in the United States or in Europe, they are more likely to get a, a CT scan. And our, our follow-up in, in Taiwan and, and the national healthcare system, uh, basically the CT is less likely to be the first option for the examiner. We usually do KV, sono, and maybe the IVP intravenal pyelography. So it's really hard for us to get these measurements for the patient. So if you can get this measurement, you can use it as the preoperative uh, consultation for this patient. So uh, it also refers back to how uh, the healthcare system is, is in your area. So if you can get a CT scan, this is very helpful for the uh, evaluation for these patients. And also you have to keep in mind the complications. Usually it's really, really slim for the shockwave. So according to the studies and our clinical experience is really rare to have these complications for these patients. So that's why I choose for the lower post stone to get a shockwave first, because we really have really low chance for complications in our department. So uh, we usually do shockwave first. If it's shockwave resistant stone, then we can revert back to a more invasive procedures. So for the percutaneous, uh, uh, also, the we do right now in my practice, I, I do uh, mini percutaneous, which is a 16 French uh, percutaneous, and we have a good results with the really big stone. So we are currently uh, having my resident combining the data, and then we're writing a paper about the mini percutaneous uh, for the for the stone. So. These are also very helpful for this patient. We usually don't do uh, any size greater than 24. Uh, our standard size for percutaneous in our department is 24 French using a balloon dilator from Cook. That's plenty of enough for really large stones. So 
Uh, also, with the rear back, I usually do mini percutaneous, and it seems higher, but our average time is around one hour to get rid of all the stones for the, for the stone. So for these, also this contraindication, for example, the coagulation, the anticoagulant therapy for these patients uh, is, is also uh, need to keep in mind because it's more prone to bleeding than compared to other procedures. So <clears throat> whether you use a uh, nephrostomy tube or the stent, uh, it also depends on how you do it. Uh, you usually, we only do uh, either a double J stent or a percutaneous stent, either way. It also depends on what your experience are. So in my practice, for the mini percutaneous, we do stentless, uh, no stent for this patient. So uh, we had good outcomes for the patient. So if anyone is interested can visit our departments or can contact us in the future about the mini percutaneous. So the complications, the hemorrhage is the most common in fever sepsis, uh, about one fourth of the patients experience fever. About one to five percent experience sepsis, but usually this is reversible. So we haven't had a death from percutaneous PCNL in our department in uh, I think 10 years or so. So uh, we have a good results with adjacent organ injury, ureter perforation. They are also keep in mind, but if you're more proficient with this surgery and then if you're more proficient in the anatomy of the percutaneous, usually we can avoid these colon perforation unless it's this really uh, strange anatomy that complete retroperitoneal colon behind the kidney. So we haven't seen these cases. So CT scan is also helpful or, or uh, you do a hybrid uh, ultrasound with, with a C-arm is really helpful for this to avoid these uh, adjacent organ injuries. So these are the complications with these patients. So uh, we keep our uh, intrarenal pressure below 40. So it, it avoid a lot of fever or sepsis complication in our patients. So uh, these are the, how we avoid it. So these are the flow chart for the post PCNL hemorrhage. We experience uh, the more you do the percutaneous, we average about 100, 150 percutaneous uh, PCNL per year. Uh, so once we notice this bleeding, severe bleeding uh, after PCNL, we usually clamp clam it, uh, have bed rest. Next day, usually the bleeding stop unless the patient has severe uh, coagulopathy. So uh, usually the clamping of the nephrostomy tube is plenty enough to stop the bleeding for one day. So uh, usually you do clam it and then check next day for the hemodynamic stability. Usually it's stable. And then you can check the lab data for the patients. So it's really helpful. So other treatment including the flexor urethroscope or laparoscopic open surgery. These are really rare cases. I have to say we usually do endoscopic, so we don't do any open or, or laparoscopic surgeries. So our main topic is urethroscope management. So the, uh, yeah, this is the uh, table that I was looking at. So you can see the combined data for the different uh, location of stone. The distal ureter stone, if they are smaller than one centimeter and larger one centimeter, you can see for the distal ureter stone, once you cross over the one centimeter stone size, usually the endoscopic is more favorable than the shockwave little treatment. So as you can see for the proximal stones, uh, if the stones is larger than one centimeter, the stone freeway is around 70. Uh, if you're using a uh, ureter scope, is uh, close to 80. So the location and size really matters depending on for the ureter stone. So that's something you can keep in mind when you're recommending the surgery for the patient. So sometimes patients don't want to have calcium or using endoscopic, then you can use several shock wave electricity for this patient. But uh, I recommend at least one. Uh, if you're over two, you're overdoing it. And sometimes you have to uh, take in consideration the anatomy for the ureter. Sometimes the ureter can be uh, stenosis or a stricture. Uh, no matter how many times you hit the stone, it will get stuck in there. So 
I suggest you can try it once to twice. Uh, anything over two times is uh, for the same location. If the stone doesn't move, don't try over two times. It usually it doesn't work. For the proximal stones, closer to the UVJ angle. So depend on if you're doing the one centimeter or less than one centimeter rule. So I suggest you can shock wave literally for at least one time and see if the stone passes. If the stone passes, then congratulations, then the, you can just follow up the patient. So for the distal ureter stone, so the more closer to the bladder, uh, endoscopic is usually more favorable if the stone is bigger. So for smaller than 0.4 centimeters, usually self passage around 90%. So uh, you can try shock tree for the largest stone. I recommend uh, endoscopic procedures. So if you take the conservative route and you do observation, usually uh, smaller stones, it usually you can pass and you can use MET. So you can add, uh, like, let's say, an alpha blocker. Uh, Tamsulosing or psilodoxing. Uh, these are also helpful to uh, pass stones, especially in lower ureters. Lower ureter, they have, they did a study, they have more alpha 1 receptors in the lower ureter stone, lower ureter uh, compared to the, to the upper ureter. So lower ureter stone, they might be more beneficial with the MET. That's really helpful. So for the shock wave, uh, also it causes less complications when the stone is in the kidney. So you can do a step rise power increment. After a shock wave is around one to one point five hertz. So for the endoscopic endorology, I suggest uh, like larger stones, less likely to passage uh, obstruction. I suggest you do endorology. For renal insufficiency, usually if they have a single kidney or bilateral obstruction, we do emergency operations for these patients and we just go in, uh, use the uh, uh, ureteroscope, we can just break the stones and put a double J stand and we can observe the patients. And then usually around two to three days, he can uh, go home and then we remove the stand around two to four weeks later. So the complications uh, associated with the ureter scope, including mucosa tear, uh, bleeding, false passage, perforation, these are, uh, I suggest the experience, the longer the surgery, uh, if the patients undergo RT, uh, it's more patient factor. So the operator experience is really, really important. So the more you do, the more you know when you do the surgery, the uh, what to do and what not to do. And if you see, basically I recommend everybody use a guide wire. Guide wire is very helpful. And once your guide wire is in there, if you have a mucosa tear, you have a perforation, put a double J stand. And double J stand, usually the mucosa healing around two to four weeks. Is, you can check after two to four weeks to see the mucosa healing. Uh, instrument failure is really, really rare, uh, but also revert back to how in your department, if your department can upkeep these uh, instruments, it's really helpful. So other patient complications, including DVT, because the patient, the leg has to be uh, on, on the, the dolphin position. So uh, you can do uh, compression stockings or uh, uh, the, the, the compression devices for the patient. It depends on what you can have in your, in your department. It's really helpful. So the other complication about including the infection, extravasation, ureteroscopy, uh, retaining stent. We have a, a computer program that it tells us every three months if we have the stent removed or not. So in your department, if you can uh, work with the IT guys, uh, if they can, after you put the internal stand in your OP record, uh, inside you can have a, a type of stand that you put in and then it will remind you every three months that the patient had the stand put in before. And then you have to key the thing in the computers to see, okay, the patient need the stand because the patient has ureter strictures and you can follow up the patient. For the stone patient, if they, you didn't remove it in three months, you can check your records if the patients have been removed. If not, you can contact the patient to come back for the removal. So that's really helpful for the retaining stand. This is how we do it. So basically, this is the, for the end of our 
talk for today. This is what we use. We use a six French and an eight French reader scope. So basically, this is our basic package for our reader scope for our ureter uh, stone removal. Basically, we have a cystoscopy. Uh, we stand the patient routinely for the patient. Guidelines in Campbell, they say uh, you don't need to stand or it depends on the doctor. So we usually stand all our patients because we're, uh, we had a few incidents with, of, of URS patients after we didn't put a stand. It caused the uh, ureter edema and then urosepsis and and that wasn't very helpful. So we usually routinely stand all our patients and we haven't had uh, anything like uh, obstruction or your causing your sepsis in the future. So we routinely uh, stand our patients for that reason. So we use that for placing our double J stand and then to remove the stone, we can usually use the six French or eight French. Usually when I teach my resident, I tell them to use the six French first to basically pre, pre dilated ureter. If they're gonna use a bass stone basket, we use the eight French ureter scope because we can use the stone basket along with the little tripsy at the same time with the eight French and with the six French, we can do that. So uh, if you're doing the technique of basking the stone and then removing it, you usually have to do eight French. And these are the pneumatic and little tripsy that we use. And these are the camera pores for the patient. And then we should gel jelly. So patient position, this is the head and this is the leg in the dotomy position. This is our uh, chief resident, Dr. Xu. And this is how we do it. This is how we position our patient. This is our television and our, our pneumatic uh, little tripsy. So how we started, we start using the cystoscopy first. We have to examine the uh, ureter and the bladder. Basically, we have to examine the whole lower urinary tract system. Sometimes we get a incidental finding of a bladder or ureter carcinoma or inverted papilloma. We have found uh, patients like that. So uh, this is how I teach your residents. Once you insert the scope, we have to put the center of the lumen in the middle. So this location is, a, is around the penile urethra. Next, we are close to external sphincter. You can see the sphincter around here. And then once we enter the sphincter, this is the varo montano, and this is where we get to the bladder neck. So this patient has no BPH, there's no kissing sign. This is the UO. Once you enter, you can see two small holes near the trigone. This is the right urethral orifice. This is the left ureter orifice. So once we identify that, we search, we, we search the whole bladder for any uh, suspicious lesion. If there's a suspicious lesion, we do a biopsy and also obtain a cytology for this patient. So for the ureter scope, this is how we do. Once we check the bladder with the cystoscopy, we pull it out and then we insert a ureter scope. Once we insert a reader scope, we can see the UO. This patient's the right side uh, has obstruction for the from the stone. Once we see the stone, we use a cat uh, guy wire. This is the guy wire. So once we insert the guy wire, the guy wire inserted these two lumens on the reader scope. So once you insert the guy wire, it's in the bottom of the reader scope. So once we put the guide wire into the ureter orifice, you also need to make sure there's no resistance when you put it in. You have to do a really smooth insertion of the guide wire. Once you insert the guide wire, we do a tenting method. Tenting method is, as you can see, once we insert it, we flip the ureter scope upside down. So once we flip it upside down, the working channel is, is in the 12 o'clock instead of the 6 o'clock region. So uh, you can see this when we flipped it, this is our tenting method. We can see the ureter orifice is more prolonged, elongated, if the guy wire is in the six o'clock region. Uh, this is really hard to explain with the pictures and the guy wire. So if anyone's interested in visiting our apartment, we can do this more hands-on and we explanation. It's, you get a more clear uh, picture for this. So once you flip it over, you can insert a reader scope from the space under here. So once we get into it, we can flip it upside down 
this is after you enter, you can see the, the guide wire is still in the 12 o'clock region. So once we enter to the 10 meter, we flip the reader scope back to uh, when the guide wire is in the 6 o'clock region. I'll show you a video right now. Once we reach the stone, you can see our chief resident is uh, doing a little tripsy. So you can see the lumen is more closed up. So basically here, we have our uh, scrub nurse uh, inject the normal saline. So a normal saline, once you inject it, uh, the lumen increases and then it will be easier for, for the operator to get rid of the stone doing the pneumatic lithotripsy. So basically we have a lot of different little tricks that we do. Uh, it's more helpful if you're in the operating room, we can explain it to you. So uh, these are the ones, the, the few ways that we can do. You can see the our scrub nurse and then the stone basket is also inside. So basically our stone basket is behind the stone already. So uh, we use the stone basket to grab the stone and then use the, a second channel to insert the, lit, the pneumatic lithotripsy inside the lumen for the stone fragmentation. So that's how we do it. So it's really helpful if you can have a stone basket. If it's not available in your area or if your healthcare provider is not able to do it, then uh, you can use the different ways to do it. Okay, this is our end of our talk. Uh, so the take home message is uh, there's different methods uh, in getting rid of the stone. So uh, take your time when you're uh, doing, uh, especially uh, your stone. Just take your time, uh, find a stone and do it. Uh, use a little tripsy. And usually you don't want too much water. So if you're working with your scrub nurse, they inject the normal saline, ask them to inject it a little bit, little bit, little by little. Don't inject it too much. Sometimes the stone will retrograde into the kidney. So also use your guy wire. I show you a way to insert your scope into the UO without too much injury. We use a denting method. Also insert it and then flip the uridoscope upside down and you can enter it to the six o'clock region. Once your guide wire is in there, in case of preparation or any avulsion, you can use the guide wire, insert a double jet stand. Don't worry about the stone, just insert a double jet stand. And the next time you can come in for the stone. So uh, you don't want to work doing the preparation or avulsion. You will just cause more damage. So once you notice any preparation or avulsion, just stop the surgery, put a double jet stand, come back later. Okay. So basically this is my talk for today. And if you have any more questions, you can contact me through our overseas offices in Zhanghua Christian Hospital. And hope you guys have a good day and thank you for listening.